you for joining us at the ever-improving No Sound Bites Allowed podcast. My name is Michael Vasquez. We thank you for joining us in this adventure of describing the politics that go on in our nation on a personal and local level as often as possible, giving you, the audience, more than just 30 seconds to understand what's going on in our nation. We look forward to joining you as we go. Just sit back, enjoy the ride. Please remember, if you like the episodes, like it, share it, let other people know. And if you can, please donate, even if it's $2, even if it's 5 because it all makes a difference. We thank you, and here we go. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us. That's right. This is the No Sound Bites Allowed podcast. I'm happy to be here with you, your host, Michael Voss, the Dragon of the Southern Tier, and I thank you, one and all, for being here with us on this program, because you make the difference. You are the reason why I'm here. And I want to thank you for joining us, because in this episode, we're going to be talking about the 2018 uh the 2018 elections, the midterms and the local elections, because it's really been heating up. Now, this isn't new. A lot of candidates have been coming out. In particular, I want to talk about New York, the Southern Tier, the New York 22nd District, which has eight counties. Uh, and I want to talk about a couple of the races there, because they really have been heating up. There's been a lot of news and a lot of events that have happened, and uh, I want to cover a bit of that. In fact, I was just talking about this at one of my other podcasts. I, I'm co-host at the SUNY Broom Republicans, uh, and it's a fantastic program. I invite you to check it out, and I'll include a link at the bottom of uh, this podcast. But we were talking about uh, some breaking news that had occurred just on April 19th, and so I want to go over that. News flash. News flash. That's right. I love that. I love that little sound effect there. And so uh, what we were talking about is Dan Livingston has announced that he is going to be running as the Democratic candidate for the Binghamton City Council 2nd District seat, which is currently held by uh, Sophia Rosanetti, who happens to be a Republican. Now, the thing that's really interesting about this race is that Dan Livingston not more than in 2017, November 2017, he just lost the Broome County clerk election. So he just lost. He just came out of an election in 2017. He lost, and here he is. He's coming back in 2018 to run for a city council seat, which is kind of odd. I mean, it's not even a pause. He's essentially looking for whatever elected office he can get into, it would seem, because he's jumping from one race to the next race. Um, he just wants to be elected. In other words, he just wants to be a Democrat in power, it would seem, because that's what he's doing. Now, I, I find it really interesting because in the news reports that come out so far, um, the main one is from Press Connects, which was on, again, April 19th by Hannah Schwartz. Um, and a very unique uh, reporter there who tends to have a very unique view of politics in the Southern tier. Um, some might call her extremely friendly to the left in her writing and the nature of her writing. Um, she obfuscates or omits certain facts and my experience in covering events with her or being part of events. She's often left out critical details um, that the public should know about. And that has continued with Press Connects and with her, Hannah, in her reporting on Dan Livingston. Because uh, Dan, who is highly supported by Citizen Action, something that Hannah Schwartz covers a lot and promotes and is very positive about, in her description of his race, she can, she left out critical facts for the public. There's two facts about Dan Livingston that are important that really should be paid attention to, and the public is being denied. The first one is that Dan Livingston has admitted and is known for and is known to have been convicted of larceny misdemeanor. So he stole something under a thousand dollars. I don't know the exact details of it because it's very hard to find that article. 
And the, it's kind of weird because I was looking at it in the SUNY Broom Republicans podcast. I was looking at, I had done some research and I was searching for this because it is a known fact and it was reported that he was in fact arrested for larceny when he lived in California and was homeless. Now, I don't know what the circumstances of that were and I didn't see and I could not find any article that would describe that. In fact, it's almost impossible to find any article about the larceny conviction for Dan Livingston. So it's a question. What happened to those articles? It was an issue. It came up in July. It was on Facebook. I know the Broome County Republicans reported on it. I know it was something that was spoken about in that election, but yet there is no article anywhere that actually says anything about it. So it seems almost as if it was scrubbed. But I do know for a fact that in terms of uh, the press connects, uh, the reporter, Hannah, did not mention to the public that this is something, uh, a conviction that this candidate had, which is important for people to understand the character, especially in a state like New York State, where we are very much in the middle of corruption all over the state. I mean, it's a serious concern, whether it's Governor Cuomo, whether it's members of the assembly who are being arrested for convictions, whether it's a judge who's being arrested because of uh, one not showing up to work for over 200 days, but also getting arrested because of buying a shotgun while being on a drunk driving conviction and probation. So our state is very much involved with concerns about the, the corruptibility of any of our candidates. So having a candidate who's been arrested for larceny, that's a big deal. Why isn't the public being told this? Why is that not being covered by the local news media? I'm really curious. But the other thing about Dan Livingston that I'm also curious to hear more about is Dan Livingston admitted, and you can find this on uh, Spectrum News, he admitted election night that he had broken, he violated election law by putting out a document the day before the election, uh, which many found to be slanderous and malicious, uh, and he denied the public knowledge of who sent it out and what it was about. And, and so he broke election law. So he has a larceny conviction and he broke election law. And that's a real question. That's something I really think people need to know about because that's a concern. We're looking at a candidate in a state known for its corruption from the governor on down that we're looking to elect a candidate who has in the past committed a crime and then even most recently has committed a crime and has no remorse and is continuing to seek election just to gain a political office. I mean, it seems that he would go for almost any elected office that was available. And I have to wonder, if the public is aware that they have a candidate who has broken and violated the law, is that the kind of person that New York State would want? Any, any, whether it's local election or higher, is that the kind of candidate that the public wants? Isn't that something that the public should know? And it's a question. You know, I, I don't know Dan Livingston personally. I've never met the man. I've invited him on and I invite him to come on to this program. He can speak as long as he wants. I, I invite him to be able to answer some of these questions. But I think voters should know. Why should they trust a candidate who has in the past and in current times broken the law? Why would you believe that this person would be an upstanding representative of the people? Why would this individual give anyone the reason to believe that he's there for their best interest. That's something the voters need to understand. And in the second district of Binghamton, I'm sure that's a question that should come up. And that's something that the reporters in particular on press connects, but all of the news agencies should ask about and say, Hey, these are things that you have done. How can voters be sure you're the right person for any elected office, let alone the ones that he's running for. Because I think that's an important question. And that's the thing that we're here for in this program. Because in 30 seconds, you really don't get the full picture, especially when you're seeing news media omit actual facts. So this isn't even a question. 
This isn't a character assassination. I'm not attacking him. This, these are facts. He was arrested. He did violate election law. And that leaves us a question, and I have to ask it. And he, as a candidate, should, is obligated, I believe, to answer that question. Why should the public trust you? Why? This is a fact that the public should know about. It is part of his character and part of his life that we should know about and we should have an answer for. And based on that answer, plus any of our promises he may make as a candidate, people can then evaluate him and say, well, he's either a better candidate or a worse candidate. And that's part of why I mean by 2018 is going to be a really rocking and rolling year. Because when we have a candidate who's coming out, and there may be another Democrat who comes up who says, hey, you know, I'm going to challenge him. Maybe he has to go into a primary. Maybe not. I don't know. Maybe he even removes himself before we even get to that point. I don't know. But he's just announced that he wants to run for this office. The Democratic Party is behind him. Apparently, at this point, citizen action is behind him at this point, as they were when he ran for the county executive seat. So we can only assume that According to the Democratic Party of Broome County, they believe that this is the best candidate that can represent the people in the city of Binghamton, a person who has committed larceny and who's violated election law for the mere purpose of being elected, someone whose ambition to gain office supersedes law and order. That is a troubling question to me. That is a troubling thing in a state that is known for its Tammany Hall-esque uh, corruption. You know, that, that doesn't make me feel like I can trust our local government and local officials knowing that there's someone willing to do just about anything it takes to try and get elected and that the Democratic Party and Citizen Action would back that person and say, that's the best we have to offer makes me seriously question, what are they thinking? I mean, that's the best you can do is to offer that. There is no other candidate in the second district of Binghamton. There is no other candidate in Broome County. There's no one else. There's no one else who's more upstanding, who is less morally corrupt or apparently corrupt. um, That is less questionable. Is that the best that they have available? It's a serious question I have to ask. And again, this isn't about Dan personally. I don't know the man personally. I'm talking about what is known facts about a candidate. And these are questions about his candidacy and whether or not these qualifications are the qualifications that justifies someone holding an elected office. So, And I'm more than happy to give him as much time as he wants on this program to answer these questions and others, because there are many others, but these are the first two that I, this is the first one that's really serious. That's my hurdle to even, I don't care if he was a Republican, I'd say the same thing, a conservative, a libertarian. uh, It doesn't matter. Any candidate who has had a conviction for stealing and that candidate has violated election law is a candidate I'm going to stand up and speak out against. I've already spoke, I've spoken out against Republicans in the past and conservatives and uh, Democrats as well. My question is not about him as a Democrat, but him as a, a candidate, period. I mean, that's the big thing. But I want to take a moment. So I wanted to bring that up, and that's the first thing, and I think it's really important. But when we come back from the break, we're going to talk a little bit more about some of the other races and some of the other surprises that are ongoing right now because there's a lot of miscommunication going on already, and we haven't even reached the summer where things will really heat up. But before I get into that, let me take a break. I hope you're enjoying this, and we'll be right back, and we'll talk a little bit more about the other breaking news in the area.
Well, hello everyone, and thank you for coming back to the No Sound Bites Allowed podcast, where I'm able to speak with you about the issues of the day that affect everyone, the politics that are affecting our lives, and not having to be restricted to 30 seconds, that minute and a half, that can that editing that often happens in the major media, and more importantly, the omissions of fact that are critical for you to make decisions. And that's why I'm here. And we were just speaking about one of those omissions of fact, a critical fact, an important fact, that what happened with Press Connects and uh, the reporter Hannah Schwartz uh, about the candidate, Dan Livingston, and his past and his uh, these factual events that happened in his past that voters should be aware of throughout the process and get an answer to so they know whether or not they're making the best choice possible not simply just uh, straight down the line, Democrat, Republican, conservative, but seriously having a choice and knowing what that choice is. And that kind of brings me to the next little bit of news that's out there. And once again. News flash. News flash. I do, in fact, love my little sound effects. I do. So, uh, one of the things I wanted to also talk about is the fact that we've seen a major uh, situation that's occurred. Now, many people have heard of Representative Nancy Pelosi. She's the House Minority Leader. She used to be the House Speaker when Democrats were in control. And she's very much involved in New York politics. Uh, she does this not directly, but indirectly. She has what's called the House Majority Pack. It's uh, misnamed, and it's meant to give an impression that there's some kind of credibility behind what is essentially a super PAC, which is something that Democrats hate, and they constantly talk about they don't want to see super PACs exist. Um, they want to get rid of them, but yet Nancy Pelosi is using one. It's, she created it. It's hers, and she directs where it attacks. So Democrats are using the very thing they say that they don't want anyone else to have. It's kind of funny, I think. But the House Majority PAC is out, and it's a tool of Nancy Pelosi to go after candidates that that Democrats don't like. It is defined, if you were to go to uh, opensecrets.org, it is defined as an organization that is looking to be critical of Democrats and, excuse me, critical of Republicans and support Democrats. And they've done that very much so. Uh, in fact, they're considered a liberal, liberal viewpoint and a super PAC. Now, this organization is, they've gotten into New York state politics, which is kind of funny since, you know, Nancy Pelosi's in California, but they've gotten themselves deeply entrenched. And they've already spent this House super PAC excuse me, the House Majority Super PAC, has already spent over $855,000 as of April 21st. But also, which has not been disclosed yet, um, is how much money they are spending on the races here in New York. They did announce on April 17th that they have already started advertising the New York 22nd congressional race. And they have already put out their ads. They're the first ones to have ads out. And they're plastering it across the southern tier and the New York 22nd District, all eight counties, including Oneida and uh, Shenango, Cortland, Madison, Tioga, uh, and Broome County, of course. Um, they're out there and they're already putting out an ad, which is a misrepresentation, talking about how uh, incumbent uh, incumbent Congresswoman Claudia Tenney has negatively impacted America based on voting for the repeal and uh, replacement of the Obamacare, which no one has liked. It still, to this day, has been negatively uh, viewed by all of America, and yet Democrats pushed it through anyway. It's since June of 2010 there has been almost no period of history where there has been a majority of Americans who actually support the SAFE Act. I think there was two weeks in the last 
uh, eight years where that's actually been above 50%. And so they're attacking Claudia Tenney about health care and reforming it and making it into something a little bit more reasonable for the general public. In fact, the bill is described as being able to eliminate the employer and individual mandates. That means the annual penalty that people have been paying, which is now over $2,000. If you don't have insurance, you're charged over $2,000 on your taxes. And um, also the employer mandate, which President Obama, it was so devastating to businesses that it's been pushed off and the Democrats never allowed it to actually take effect. But this is, you know, it would remove the new health care bill, the repeal, H.R. 1628, which was done in 2017. Uh, this would help to pay for Medicaid. It's described as allowing the states to have more flexibility and making sure that health and health benefits are available to the public. It's described as stabilizing the premiums for the public, looking at a long term stability and reducing the income ceiling for Medicaid. So these are some of the things that it's meant to do to help the public. And while it may not be well loved because, you know, anything that happens under the Trump administration is bad, according to the news media, this is what we're seeing Claudia Tenney attacked about by Nancy Pelosi in California. Not that she knows anything about New York politics. That troubles me that an outside force is jumping into the middle of the New York politics. And I'd say the same thing about any of the Republican PACs jumping in without having any knowledge. And so I'm watching this commercial and it's just, it's so blatantly wrong, but I find it interesting that they're talking about this and it's coming from an organization. Now Democrats love to talk about or the Democrat leadership love to talk about how wall street is evil. Well, the, one of the largest groups actually donating to the House Majority PAC, Nancy, Nancy Pelosi Super PAC, is Wall Street and also unions. So unions and Wall Street are the main donors to this PAC. That's where they're getting their money from. The very same people that Democrats say that they don't like and that they want to take money away from. Those are the very same people giving them the money for these laws. So I have to ask, how serious are they? Is this really about whether or not this is a good law? No. Are they talking about whether or not Claudia Tenney is doing her job? Because that's an, that's an important question to ask. What is she doing? She's actually released, uh, she's already proposed 17 bills. 17 bills. And to give you an idea of what kind of impact that is, Claudia Tenney has been in office for two years. This is the second year that she's been a member of Congress. And in those two years, she has proposed 17 bills in the entire six years that representative Hannah, who was in charge of the, he represented the New York 22nd district beforehand uh, for six years, he was able to propose four bills. So she's done four times the work, 400% more work for the nation and our state and the New York 22nd district. But you don't hear, Nancy Pelosi speaking about that because, you know, she's there to represent Democrats and hate on Republicans. So that's just, I find it very interesting. And I see that in the announcement by Nancy Pelosi and her super PAC, they're talking about how, you know, Claudia Tenney is a career politician. Keep in mind, she's been in Congress for two years. If you include 2018, her reelection year, first reelection to Congress. Nancy Pelosi has been in elected office for 31 years, 31. She got elected in 1987 and in New York state. Well, there's Elliot Engel, who's been around for 31 years. Um, there is, excuse me, 30 years. Elliot Engel has been elected for 30 years. Nita Lowy, also a Democrat, 30 years. And there's also, uh, that is, those are the two main, those are the most senior members of Congress for the Democratic Party. The next one would be in 1990, which is her, uh, Representative Serrano uh, for New York as well. And he's been in there for uh, 27 years. 
So it, it's kind of crazy. You want to talk about career politicians, three decades in office, that's a career. Two years in office, not so much. So I just find it interesting. And I, I just wanted to cover about a bit about that because we need some honesty in our elections. I, I really wish that Nancy Pelosi would say, hey, I run the super PAC and I don't like a Republican, so I'm going to go after them. Because, by the way, it's not just Claudia Tenney that they're going after. They've already spent money going after uh, Faso, Representative Faso, and they're also going against a couple of other candidates as well. Matter of fact, let me bring that up so I can tell you intelligently. Uh, they've also targeted, in New York State, uh, Lee Zeldin as well. So they're already spending money in those races, having spent over, uh, over $7,000 in each of those races, but have severely spent more money on the New York 22nd race, which is a targeted race that Republicans want. And by the way, who's the Democratic candidate? Well, that is Mr. Anthony Brindisi, who I have invited to this program since May of 2017. I have offered him as much time as he wants on here without edit to speak about anything and everything in the campaign. Uh, we've spoken, he and I, over the last five, six years, I believe, and I'm more than happy to talk to him about the scandal in Utica with $300 million that he's involved with, the fact that he's using eminent domain uh, to take away the property of homeowners and businesses in Utica, something that's not gotten a lot of attention throughout the nation, his position on whether or not he plans to increase taxes along with Nancy Pelosi, who has been his main supporter ever since he actually went out in March of 2017 to speak with her in Washington, D.C., uh, which he's already admitted that he did, in fact, have that meeting. And, you know, I, what can we say? There's a big difference between the candidates. Now, I'm more than happy to look at that, but I just wish, kind of like what we're seeing with Dan Livingston, the public is not being given the full story. They're being told parts of it, specific parts that are geared to only say one thing. Now, in, in the case with the House Majority Super PAC, obviously there are going to be ads from the Republican side, and they'll counter that, and that's fine. But I think the public should know who is the House Super PAC. Well, that's Nancy Pelosi. Just that simple. And that should be that honest. And I say the same thing about any Republican Super PAC. They should say, well, um, this is the Republican that's behind that. And let's be honest and tell people about it. And if there is a Republican Super PAC that comes out in favor of Claudia Tenney, which there will be, I want them to say, hey, this is the person who's behind that. And I'm supporting her as a Republican. And I wish Nancy Pelosi would be that honest as well. They're not because they don't think that that would sell. Otherwise, Nancy Pelosi would come out and tell you that. But she won't. And they don't want to tell you about the fact that on March 7th and again uh, just two weeks ago, they've come out and said they plan to raise income taxes. The Democratic Party, if they win in the midterms in 2018, they're going to raise your taxes, personal taxes, business taxes. They want more of your money, which goes right along with Governor Cuomo, who added another billion dollars in fees, which means taxes, and he's taking more of your money. That's just incredible to me. More money coming out, going to the government, more power to the government, but less to you. I wish they were more honest about that. But I wanted to cover that as well. So in the next break, we're going to a somewhat different subject, but we'll be right back in just a moment.
Hello, everybody, and thank you for coming back to the No Sound Bites Allowed podcast, your favorite podcast with your host, Michael Voss, the Dragon of the Southern Tier. I'm here for you folks, and I thank you for being here with us because you make the difference. You're the reason why I do all of this. So I do thank you for that. Now, in the first episode, uh, first segment, we were talking a bit about Dan Livingston and the omissions of facts that have been put out there by Press Connects and some of the other news media in not telling people about his larceny conviction and his violation of election law. These are facts. It's not an opinion. And in addition, we were talking in the second segment about the fact that the House Majority Pack is, in fact, Nancy Pelosi and her targeting of Republicans which is based only on her ideology and being involved in the New York 22nd race is just trying to get more Democrats. That's all they're trying to do. So that being said, there's also some other things that we can talk about. Now, one of the things I wanted to also go into is something that most people are probably familiar with, which is the balanced budget amendment, which would be HJ res two. Uh, or H.J. Resolution, House Joint Resolution 2. And there was recently, on April 12th, there was a uh, vote in Congress, and we know that 179 Democrats and six Republicans refused to vote for this bill. Now, what is the bill? Quite simply, it's the Balanced Budget Amendment. That's it. It's about a balanced budget. And in this balanced budget, what we find is that you know, this is so that the government would not, will not spend more than we take in. And we take in an over $3 trillion in taxes per year. You just pay taxes. Everyone did. And, or correction, the majority of people didn't. <laughs> Most people get a refund and the top incomes pay for it. Small business owners and such. And, but our government spends way more than what we're able to bring in. I believe it's about $6 trillion. Uh, that's, oh, excuse me, $4 trillion that's spent by the government, even though $3 trillion is what we take in. I'm rounding off a little bit. And so the question that I have is, why, why were 179 Democrats and six Republicans not willing to live or make the government live the same way that you and I have to? Think about it. Why is it that they're not willing to restrict the government to only the money they have at hand? Because that's what we do. You know, every regular person, if you don't have the money, you can't buy something. You, we would all love to own a Lamborghini, as an example. Or you'd love to have a mansion for the house that you live in. Or maybe it's something just as simple as you want to get a big screen TV, a brand new computer. But you don't have the money. So you can't spend money. And if you happen to have credit cards or maybe a loan, maybe you're able to get a little bit more, but there's a limit on that because every credit card has a limit. Every loan has a limit. You can only go so much further than your ability to pay and then you're cut off and you can't spend more money. But our government doesn't do that. Our government spends as much as it wants. And yes, I'm upset that in the latest continuing resolution, the Republican Party spent $1.3 trillion. That's huge. That's ridiculous. It's way too much spending. And I agree with uh, uh, Senator Paul, Rand Paul, in condemning this and saying, why are we spending all this money? It's more money than we have. And it's the same objection we had against uh, President Obama, who doubled the national debt. He took us from $10 trillion to $20 trillion in eight years the greatest amount of spending ever every you can literally add up all of the presidents before him and you would have approximately to the penny almost exactly the same amount of spending that's insane since the creation of our country president obama spent essentially as much money as everybody put together and now we have president trump coming out with a $1.3 trillion deficit, a spending bill, which is going to increase the debt. We're at $21 trillion now. Is that a problem? Yes. How do you fix that problem? 
cut the purse strings from Congress. Restrict them to being able only to spend the money that we have. And that's what the balanced budget amendment was supposed to do. It was going to make it so that it would require two-thirds of the members of Congress and the Senate to be able to go and spend more money than we have, which is almost impossible to do, to get two-thirds of the House and two-thirds of the Senate to agree to anything is almost impossible. So in other words, you wouldn't be able to spend more money than the government is able to bring in, essentially. And that would mean that we would reduce our deficit because we would actually be doing what every single one of the voters in America does, spending what you have, doing the same thing that people who pay taxes do, spending what you have. And by the way, the number of people who vote is not the number of people in America. The number of people who pay taxes is not the number of people in America. Let's get that straight. So we're talking about a smaller group than everybody, but still, this is the life that we live. Why shouldn't our representatives be held to that? But 179 Democrats and six Republicans all said, <coughs> they all said that that's not possible. Now, m mind you, I know I've been mentioning a lot of uh, specific names. I want people to look this up themselves. See for yourself who's involved. I can tell you that Representative Claudia Tenney was not one of the six uh, Republicans who voted against that. She voted in favor of the balanced budget, just because I mentioned her name before. And Nancy Pelosi was against the balanced budget. She was one of the Democrats who voted against that, since I brought up their names. But for everyone else and every other uh, representative, please look that up for yourself and ask yourself, why won't Congress do what you do every day? Have a budget and live by it. Why are we spending so much money, more than we could possibly take in? Why are we continuing to grow our debt at a pace that is unsustainable? Everyone's agreed on that. We agreed on it before President Obama was in office when it was under President Bush. We agreed about that back in the Clinton days and even under Reagan. We agree on it today. It's unsustainable. We can't continue to have this debt. So why would 79, 179 Democrats and six Republicans not agree and say, no, the government should spend as much as it wants. I have to tell you, the only thing I can think of is because it's a power play. And it kind of falls in line with a lot of things. If there's 165 million people in America who receive money from the government, some form of aid, there's about 155 million people who actually work. So everybody who works plus a few more are people who are receiving money from the government, okay? And there's 327 million people in America. So you gotta take out the kids, retirees, uh, people who are disabled. There's 155 million people who actually work and 165 million people actually receive money from the government. And if you were to actually have a balanced budget, that 165 million has to go down. It has to, it's not even a question. You have to reduce that. But if, and this is where the power is, if you're receiving money from the government to live and everyone wants to get stuff, so you're getting an Obama phone or you're getting a subsidy for whatever, food stamps, uh, because you're not working, whatever it may be. If you're getting money from the government, you can't really say to the government, stop that. Stop spending money wastefully. You can't really say that because that means it's your money. You're on the hook. You are actually beholden to the elected officials and the government because they're giving you money. Rather than giving people the opportunity to make money or keep the money that they make and allow them to have more freedom, you're beholden to a government that's giving you the money and giving you the ability to live. That's probably why 179 Democrats and six Republicans voted to not have a balanced budget because if they can just spend as much as they want and give you money so that you'll live the way they want you to live and you can only do the things they're allowing you to do because they gave you the money for that, then you have to listen to them, not 
the other way around, like our government was created, where you have to listen to them. Excuse me, the government, that the government has to listen to the people. If the government's giving you money, they are your employer. They get to control things, just like your job. You can't do anything you want at your job. You have to do what your boss says because your boss is paying you. If he wants you to do a job a certain way, right or wrong, that's what he's paying you to do. Or she is paying you to do. So that's the job you do. There is no difference when the government is giving you money. If 165 million people are receiving money from the government to do certain things, to spend money in a certain way on certain foods or in certain activities or certain programs, that means they're they're basically they're paying you to live. They're paying you and you're working for them. You're living for them in this case. And that's control. And, you know, unless you plan to live for yourself, work for yourself, you're stuck. But they don't want you to do that. They want you to stay under their control and make sure that you're going to vote just the way they want you to because they're giving you money. And it's free money. It's free money. There's absolutely no strings attached. You can do whatever you want, except we have the money that you need to live with. Rather than having lower taxes, less government involvement, you have your money and you're able to make the choices for yourself. And you can spend the money where you think it should be spent so that you can have a better life. That would be better. That would stimulate the economy. That would grow small business, create innovation, allow you to do things. But rather than do that, 179 Democrats, six Republicans decided that you need to do what they say. That scares me. And that's something that's not covered a lot. Because the balanced budget amendment, which is House Joint, uh, House Joint Resolution 2, wasn't covered. No one talked about it. It was, I mean, it was announced, but the media just pushed it aside, pushed it aside. It's kind of like the shooter in the, uh, at the YouTube. The Lebanese woman who went out and attacked YouTube, and because that was not a white male, going on a rampage, you don't hear about that story. No one's talking about it. Why not? It was a shooting. We hear shootings all the time. They go crazy when it's a white male and that they have a gun and they go in and they shoot someone, especially if they think it's a, a Republican, especially if they think it's a conservative, the media goes absolutely ape. But you notice when it's not, when it's known to be someone who is not a white male, when it's known to be someone who's a foreigner, someone that's known to be uh, a woman, uh, anything that doesn't fit their very specific attack mantra, just ignore it. Just let it go. Well, same thing here. They're talking about balancing the budget and not spending wildly and damaging the future for your kids. Media just lets it go because it's about control. At least that's what it would appear to be. But it's a lot of things. So we've talked about a lot. And hopefully I, I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope you found something interesting about it as we were talking about the omissions of fact about Dan Livingston when we're talking about the reality of who is the House Majority PAC and the intent of Nancy Pelosi and the misperceptions being put out there when we're talking about the balanced budget amendment and how it's a matter of control and it makes no sense why it would not pass and the questions we should ask. And overall, it's, it's all about these are questions we should ask our elected officials and we should get answers. And if you haven't asked them, you should. And before you make a vote, you should know the answers to these things and know for yourself what's, what the facts are. Check me. I'll have links down there. You can check it. Decide for yourself. Because once you know, you can make the best decision possible. And that's all I want to see. So I thank you for the time today. And hopefully you'll come back to our episode again. But until then, I will see you next week at No Sound Bites Allowed. Thank you again.